Let's get weird into it. Number 10. The party trick muscle. Go ahead. Do this with me right now. Put your arm out. Palm up. Now touch your pinky to your thumb and flex your wrist just a little bit. See that tendon that just popped up in the middle of your wrist, like a little tent pole. Congratulations, you have a palmaris longus muscle. Or maybe you don't. Don't panic. If you're in the 10 to 15% of the population whose wrist is perfectly smooth, you're not broken. You're just more evolved. This long, skinny muscle is a direct-to-you souvenir from your distant tree-swinging ancestors. For primates who spent their days brachiating, that's the fancy word for Tarzaning through the jungle, this muscle was crucial for a strong grip on branches. For you, whose most intense arm-swinging activity is probably flagging down a bus or grabbing the last bag of chips from the top shelf, it's basically decorative. Your body has a bunch of other, more competent muscles that do all the heavy lifting for your wrist and hand. The palmaris longus is just hanging out, a relic of a life you never lived. It's so pointless that when surgeons need a tendon to reconstruct another, more important part of your body, this is the first one they go for. They just snip it out and move it somewhere else. It is the ultimate organ donor, a spare part you can give away while you're still using the machine. It's your body's equivalent of keeping your baby teeth in a jar, a weird, slightly gross reminder of a past you've completely outgrown. Number 9. Your built-in goggles. Imagine watching a lizard. Its eye, unblinking, stares back. And then, a ghostly, translucent film slides across its eyeball from the side. It's a third eyelid, a biological windshield wiper that protects the eye and keeps it moist without fully closing it. Birds have it. Sharks have it. Your cat has it. And so do you. Sort of. Look in the mirror. See that little pink fleshy bit in the inner corner of your eye, right next to your tear duct? That's called the plica semilunaris, and it is the sad, shriveled, retired remnant of your very own third eyelid. Back when our ancestors were maybe living in dustier, grittier, or wetter environments, this membrane would have been a full-on, functional eyelid. It would have swept across your cornea, clearing debris and providing protection, like a pair of built-in safety goggles. But now, now it's just there. It produces a bit of that gunk you wipe out of your eyes in the morning, but that's about the extent of its job description. It's a ghost in your eye socket, a tiny pink monument to a feature your body decided was no longer worth the upkeep. It just sits there, watching you scroll through your phone for hours, a silent vestigial witness to how little you need to protect your eyes from the dangers of the modern world. Number 8. The Elf Ears Run your finger along the outer rim of your ear, that curved bit of cartilage at the top. You might feel a little bump, a slight thickening or point along the ridge. If you have it, you've found what's known as Darwin's tubercle. It's a leftover fold from a time when your ancestors had bigger, pointier ears. Think Spock, but less logical. In many mammals, pointy ears act like little satellite dishes, helping to funnel and focus sound waves. They can even swivel independently to pinpoint the location of a predator, or, more likely, a tasty snack. Our ancient primate relatives had a similar setup. But as humans evolved, our ears got smaller, rounder, and significantly less mobile. The muscles that once let us pivot our ears like a cat are now mostly useless, though some people can still wiggle theirs, and the pointy tip has been reduced to this tiny, insignificant bump. It serves no function. It doesn't help you hear better. It doesn't do anything except act as a tiny genetic marker, a little arrow pointing back up your evolutionary tree. It's your body's equivalent of a single pixel from an old photo that got stuck on the screen. It's a whisper of a feature, the faint anatomical echo of a time when your ears weren't just for holding up your glasses. Number seven, the useless abs. You can do a thousand crunches a day. You can sculpt a perfect six pack, but you will never ever be able to show off your pyramidalist muscle, mostly because it's tiny. And for about 20% of people, it's not even there. This small triangular muscle sits in your lower abdomen, right on top of your rectus abdominis, the muscles that actually make up that six pack. Its job is to tense a fibrous band of tissue called the linea alba. And unless you're a kangaroo, that is a profoundly useless skill. See, the pyramidalis is a big deal in marsupials. It's one of the muscles they use to control and tense their pouch, keeping the joey snug and secure. Our ancestors, somewhere way, way back, shared a lineage with these pouched mammals. But, as you've probably noticed, humans traded in the built-in baby carrier for things like, you know, arms. So this little muscle is a holdover, a piece of biological software for hardware you don't have. For the 80% of humans who still have it, it does effectively nothing. It occasionally contracts when you cough, 
like it's trying to remember its ancient, important purpose. But its contribution is so negligible that you'd never notice if it was gone. It's your body's laziest employee, the one who shows up, clocks in, and then spends all day hiding in the break room. A forgotten relic from a completely different company. Number 6. Your inner lizard. You walk into a kitchen and smell baking bread, and your brain says, Food. Good. You smell smoke, and your brain says, Danger. Bad. But what if you could smell... Emotions? What if you could detect the chemical signals of fear, or attraction, or territory, hanging in the air like a cheap perfume? Other animals can. And you technically have the equipment for it. It just doesn't work. Inside your nose, you have something called the vomeronasal organ, or Jacobson's organ. In snakes, cats, and many other mammals, this is a chemosensory superpower. It's a special organ that detects pheromones, the chemical messengers that govern social and reproductive behaviors. When a snake flicks its tongue, it's not tasting the air. It's gathering scent particles and delivering them directly to this organ. You have one too. It's a tiny pit inside your nasal cavity. The hardware is installed. The problem is, the wiring has been cut. In humans, the vomeronasal organ has no functional nerve connections to the brain. It's a disconnected phone line. It's a USB port with nothing plugged into it. Our ancestors likely used it. But as primates began to rely more on vision, especially color vision, for spotting ripe fruit and potential mates, the sense of smell, particularly this specialized pheromonal sense, took a back seat. Evolution just stopped paying the subscription fee. So you walk around every day with a dormant, fossilized superpower tucked away in your skull, completely blind to a whole world of chemical information that's floating right under your nose. Number five, the phantom tail. There are few pains as uniquely sharp and humiliating as missing a chair and landing directly on your tailbone. It's a lightning bolt of agony that shoots up your spine, and the whole time, your body is screaming at you for injuring an organ that isn't even there anymore. Your tailbone, or coccyx, is exactly what it sounds like. It's the remnant of a tail. It's composed of three to five fused vertebrae at the very bottom of your spine. For our primate ancestors, a tail was an essential tool for balance as they navigated the treetops. But as our ancestors came down from the trees and started walking upright, the tail became an inconvenience, a liability. So, evolution slowly whittled it away, vertebra by vertebra, until all that was left was this tiny, internal stub. Today, its only real job is to serve as an anchor point for a few minor ligaments and muscles, none of which would be particularly lost without it. It's a king who lost his kingdom, but was allowed to keep a small, uncomfortable chair in the basement of the castle. And to add insult to injury, it remains one of the most exquisitely painful parts of the body to injure. It's your body's way of punishing you for the evolutionary choices of your great-great-great etc. grand monkeys. And just to prove it hasn't completely forgotten, on extremely rare occasions, babies are born with a short, fleshy, vestigial tail. A little reminder that your body still has the blueprints for its monkey business. Number 4. The Outlaw Teeth. Deep inside your jaw, four ticking time bombs are waiting. They are biding their time, sometimes for decades, before they decide to make your life a living hell. They are your third molars, better known as wisdom teeth. And they are evolutionary outlaws, ancient relics that no longer fit in the civilized world of your modern mouth. Our distant ancestors had much larger, more robust jaws. They needed them to chew through a tough diet of raw plants, roots, and meat. With all that real estate, a third set of molars popping up in early adulthood was no big deal. It was actually helpful, replacing other teeth that may have been worn down or lost. But then two things happened. We discovered fire, and our brains got bigger. Cooked food is softer, requiring less chewing power, so our jaws began to shrink. At the same time, our craniums expanded to accommodate our growing brains. The result? A major zoning crisis in your skull. Your jaw is now prime, high-demand property, and there's simply no room for these late-arriving tenants. So when your wisdom teeth try to move in, they get stuck. They grow in sideways. They push against other teeth, they become impacted, infected, and excruciatingly painful. They are perfectly good teeth with nowhere to go. And so you end up paying a surgeon thousands of dollars to violently shatter and evict these biological squatters that your own body foolishly invited to the party. Number three, nature's speed bumps. It's a cold night. You're watching a horror movie. The killer jumps out, the violin screeches, and suddenly the skin on your arms prickles. A thousand tiny bumps rise up, goosebumps. 
You're cold, you're scared. But what is your body actually trying to accomplish here? Is it hoping the killer will be intimidated by your suddenly bumpy forearms? No. It's running an ancient defense program that's been obsolete for millennia. Every single hair on your body is attached to a tiny muscle called an erector pili. When this muscle contracts, it pulls the hair follicle, causing the hair to stand on end and creating that little bump on your skin. For our ancient, much furrier ancestors, this was a brilliant two-in-one feature. When they were cold, puffing up their fur would trap a layer of air against the skin, creating a natural layer of insulation. When they were threatened, making their hair stand on end would make them appear bigger and more intimidating. Think of a Halloween cat with its back arched. For you, a relatively hairless ape, this mechanism is a hilarious failure. Your pathetic little arm hairs stand up, trapping approximately zero insulating air. You don't look bigger or scarier. You just look goosebumpy. It's a biological bluff. Your body is screaming, fear me, for I am large and furry. But all that comes out is a faint, bumpy whisper. It's a physiological ghost, a reflex from a time when your skin was more than just a canvas for bad tattoos. Number two, the biological grenade. Tucked away at the junction of your small and large intestine is a small finger-shaped pouch about nine centimeters long. It's your appendix, and its primary job in the 21st century seems to be to randomly decide to kill you. For decades, we thought it did nothing at all. A classic vestigial organ, probably used by our ancestors to help digest tough plant matter like cellulose. A worm-like souvenir from our leaf-eating days. But more recent science has a different theory. The appendix might actually be a safe house, a secure bunker for your good gut bacteria. When you get a nasty stomach bug and your digestive system wages biological warfare on itself, the appendix can shelter a reserve army of beneficial microbes, ready to repopulate your gut once the crisis is over. It's a brilliant backup system, a living seed bank. There's just one tiny fatal flaw in the design. Its entrance can get blocked, and when it gets blocked, it gets infected. And when it gets infected, it swells and swells until it ruptures spilling poison into your body cavity in a life-threatening condition called peritonitis. It's the biological equivalent of storing your emergency water supply in a container made of nitroglycerin. Its one helpful function is completely overshadowed by its catastrophic failure mode, turning a quiet Tuesday afternoon into a frantic, siren-blaring race to the operating room to remove the ticking time bomb your own body manufactured. Number one, the first default setting. If you are a biological male, you have nipples. They're right there, present, accounted for, and doing absolutely, positively nothing. They are perhaps the most famous useless body part of all, but they're not useless in the same way as the appendix or the tailbone. They aren't vestigial remnants from a distant ancestor. They're artifacts from your own personal history, the first few weeks of your existence. In the earliest stages of development, every human embryo follows the same basic blueprint, a default female pathway body plan. Male and female embryos are anatomically identical for the first several weeks. During this time, fundamental structures are laid down, including the mammary glands and nipples. It's only later, around week six or seven, that the Y chromosome, if present, activates and starts producing hormones like testosterone that steer development down the male path. This is when the biological script forks. But by the time that happens, the nipples have already been made. The factory has already installed them. For female development, they'll continue to develop into functional mammary glands. For male development, the hormonal signal essentially says, okay, cancel that program, but you can't uninstall the hardware. So they just stay. They are non-functional placeholders. They're the biological equivalent of a fake button on a piece of electronics, left there because it was part of the original design mold and it was easier to leave it than to retool the whole assembly line. They are a permanent physical reminder that for the first moments of your life, your body was working from a universal starter pack before it got the memo on which version it was supposed to become. And that's our time for today. More strange things are always coming, so I'll see you in the next one.